I'm really uber excited to talk to Nora Casey today. Nora, welcome. Tell us a little bit in your own words what you do and how you got there. I think I always say it's not what I did in my life. It's what life did to me that has defined everything. I grew up in a beautiful place. It's called the Phoenix Park. It's the largest inner city park in Europe. My father and my grandfather were rangers, so my back garden was huge and beautiful. And I think if you asked the younger Nora what she wanted to be, I would never have said a businesswoman. I didn't even know businesswomen existed. I'd never met one. I didn't see one in the newspapers, on television. So I come from a long line of nurses. And I went to Scotland at the age of 17 to train as a nurse. Uh, people always find that a little bit odd, given what I did in the rest of my life. But I loved nursing. I spent five years in Scotland, um, not just getting my registered general nurse qualifications, but burns and plastics and coronary care. But I also realized it probably wasn't for me. At that time, nursing, it really wasn't the kind of profession that encouraged free thinking. And I felt that there were too many constraints for me to be able to do all the things I wanted to do. So weirdly, as my father said, I went from Angel to Rottweiler and trained to be a journalist in Harlow, uh, which is one of the only four recognized training programs for journalists in Britain at the time. And, and for most of my 20s, lived the typical normal journalistic life of news reporter, news editor, deputy editor, editor, until I came to 30 and I became CEO. And I think um, I was the worst CEO on the planet. Recently, I did a podcast, which was tell us your worst boss. And I had to admit it was me. I was the worst boss because although I spent my 20s studying TV production, print journalism, radio journalism, I, nobody had ever taught me how to manage teams. And I wanted to be everyone's friend. Um, they used to say Nora's indecision is final because I would go around the table so often saying, and what do you think? And what do you think? So I took myself to Ashridge Management College for two years and I studied strategic management. I actually went back and did advanced strategic management. So, so the one skill I've relied on the whole of my life is probably strategy in my personal life and my business life. I'm going to fast forward to uh, me moving back to Dublin. I was running a suite of companies in New York, London and Dublin for a big corporate firm and they were very keen to do uh, to sell off these non there were non core assets so i did a management buyout in 2004 and then and in turn set up my own business harmonia which was the largest magazine publisher here we had digital assets and uh, we published in mainly the us in europe in ireland a little in china um, then i think dragon's den approached me in America, it's Shark Tank. I discovered recently there are lions in Germany, but in Britain and Ireland and lots of Canada, lots of parts of the world, they're called dragons. It wasn't a really difficult decision for me because I'm very comfortable on television. I had worked, you know, for a lot of my life doing television and radio. So I was intrigued about the investment potential because as I was making profits on the business, I was in, of course, I was just putting them back into other businesses, but I liked my safety zone. So, you know, I kept putting money into the kind of businesses I owned. So I have to say at that time, if I gave anybody a million euro, you wouldn't put them into magazines because, uh, you know, the conversations, I'd already lost 11 million on a digital play. So I was feeling that I needed to get out of uh, media. Um, Dragon's Den was great. I sat with my arms folded and 55 people came in and pitched their business ideas to me. Some of them crazy, completely crazy, and some of them quite brilliant. I, I ended up with um, 14 investments. Um, some of them, I would have had more fun putting my money down the toilet, quite frankly. I learned a very harsh lesson that it's not the idea, it's the person. And of course, Dragon's Den is all about the big reveal. And suddenly you see, but you really don't know the person. And if that person has not got entrepreneurial DNA, there's no, it doesn't matter how long I spend mentoring them and coaching them and working with them, they're never going to change. So uh, particularly, I have to say in tech, they're always fiddling. They will never want to launch this. Always just another bug fix they have to do. So I've left, uh, I have three now from that tranche and uh, they're brilliant three. Of course, I have my own five companies. They're all involved in publishing, but I have a company that does documentaries and film. And I think that's where my area lies now. I do more documentaries and films than I do almost anything else. And I have a great company called Planet Woman, uh, 
It's a digital learning platform for young women between 23 and 33. I think in, in my peer group, which is C-suite CEO, women on boards, they don't need my help. Everyone is available to them. They have all the best networks. They get to do all of the great things. Even their corporate employers will invest in them. Young women between 23 and 33, that's where the corporate pain is. That's where we lose most of the brilliant minds, female minds. So I really exclusively only work with that group. And um, they come out of university, often have better qualifications than the boys, but somehow when we put them into corporate life or as female founders, they just struggle to stay there. And uh, and that's and that's kind of my passion is probably that area. J just a couple of things that uh, might help. One is, um, I started off saying it was what life did to me. In my 20s, I married a much older man when I was 23. Um, unfortunately, he was very violent. Um, he was very powerful. He was very wealthy. I unfortunately spent nine years with him. And, um, and I have all of the external scars. I think in one brutal beating, I broke a bone in my face here. So my smile is a little lopsided. So I always think when I'm at my happiest, I'm reminded of the fact that he you know, punched me so hard there that I broke some muscle damage and some pain. Um, I only spoke about that about four years ago on national television. And I've done a TEDx, only the second person in history as a survivor who has spoken about that. And it was a very, it was a very hard thing to do. I've just finished a documentary, given testimony again. Um, it's hard because it's almost re-traumatizing. You know, I, I sort of buried those years quite deep through the lens of time I forgive myself for always feeling I was the one to blame and all the time in my 20s when I was learning new skills for my career I was also learning other skills about how to survive how to put makeup on to hide the bruises um, how to keep things even keel every time I was subjected to a violent attack I would almost internalize that what did I do what did I say how did I trigger that could I have been better at handling him um, thankfully, I left him after many failed attempts. Um, I think the, the one thing that's always intrigued me is not why you stay, because it's very complex when love is bound up with power and emotion. I was very young. I didn't understand what love was. Um, but the real question for me is, how did you leave? If we captured those stories from women, uh, we'd really have something quite powerful. I left because my mother witnessed um, the final slap. <laughs> Uh, she was in London at the time. She saw what he did. She tackled me about it. And uh, she said, you have to leave him or your two brothers will be spending time in jail for murdering him. And that hit home. I knew once one other person outside of my life knew about it. No one else had. Um, so I packed a very small bag one Friday morning. I had nothing to my name. Believe you me, when you're in a domestic abusive relationship, somehow or other, I had all the debt and I had no money. And he had he had the house, he had everything. So I knew leaving him was going to be difficult because I didn't have anywhere to live. But I packed a very small bag and I'd rehearsed a speech about 50 times in the car. I lived in South London and I was always working in North London. So this speech was a big explanation as to why I was leaving him. And, um, and I woke him up, it was about 5 a.m. in the morning. I'd showered, I'd packed my little bag and I, he said, what's happening? I said, I'm leaving you. He started to laugh and said, you know, get back into bed. And I started my speech. And after about two minutes, I could hear him snoring in the background. He was fast asleep. So I just went downstairs and got into my car and I felt like I was falling off a cliff. It was the most extraordinary feeling. I spoke to my sister for probably the first half hour of the journey to work. Of course, I couldn't tell anyone at work. Um, but there was a little thing inside me that kept saying, that's never going to happen to you again. You're not going to let anyone own you financially or bodily or mentally. And I don't think I would have done anything in my life had I not taken that big decision. I'm an ambassador at the moment for a, a strong women's campaign about women survivors. I think people always see them as weak, but actually they're the strongest women in the world. You know, when I think back of how I got through those years, I know that I had strength and resilience. Now, confidence came a little bit later for me, um, but leaving Peter was the best decision I ever made. And, um, and also, 
it gave me a chance to meet my second husband, Richard, who was the love of my life. I had my beautiful son, Dara, who is amazing, doing his master's in archaeology. But I also would never have set up so many businesses. I just wouldn't. I wouldn't have. Anyone who starts off in life wanting to be a nurse doesn't have an ambition to make millions, even though I did. But I didn't do it for that reason. Um, the reason I'm telling you that is that I'm a, I'm a hybrid, probably humanitarian nurse businesswoman. Almost all of my documentaries now are in humanitarian causes, particularly with women. Um, I did three last year. And I, I think that is where I feel most fulfilled, probably. Sadly, my husband, Richard, died um, of cancer very young at 48. Um, but to be honest, I'm grateful that I had that love in my life. A lot of people don't. It is so unbelievably touching. And I'm so very grateful, Nora, for talking so openly and being so vulnerable and really going in the nitty gritty of your journey because it really is um, not only showing how you got to where you are today, but it's really uh, giving hope for other women who are in the same position and who then have the opportunity to draw an enormous amount of power and strength from difficult situations. So I really am super grateful. You've done so much. I mean, it is unbelievable. And how you did it, I don't know, but we're going to find out more. You you also wrote a book, you're a speaker, you um, coach uh, uh, startups and entrepreneurs, you are a philanthropist, you really got into the um, topic of grief, you've done a TED talk on it, you, you, you've been working with the Hospice Foundation, I mean, you've done so much. Give us an idea what your main motivator is behind all of it. Thanks, Stephanie. I think as we go through life, things things impact on us, you know. So the funny thing about Richard's illness, which was aggressive and very difficult and very fast from a fit, healthy 48-year-old, four months later, he was dead. The bit that always terrified both of us was his death. And I didn't know what that would be like, you know. When I was a nurse, we used to always talk about death with dignity. And I always felt it was a bit overrated, like if you die, you die. But actually, the most beautiful thing for, for, for Dara and me was his death. It was very beautiful in a hospice. Um, my sister had died a few months before Richard got ill. And unfortunately, she died in a hospital with the clatter of knives and forks and television blaring down the corridor and visitors coming and going. And the doctors didn't know how to help her. She had a debilitating disease and they didn't know how to help her to pass peacefully, you know. Um, I, I was very struck by that, that everyone deserves to have a beautiful death and to die in the most dignified way. And how it was such a blessing for me and Dara afterwards to to remember that. So you're right, that that felt like something I needed to do something about. So I did a documentary. It's very difficult, by the way, to get people to watch a program on a Thursday night at half nine about death. But I brought in, uh, you know, actors like Gabriel Byrne and comedians. And, you know, we used as much fun as well as the rituals. And, um, you know, I interviewed some incredibly brave people, all of whom have passed away since that were facing death at the time. So it, I still felt like something that was it was an authored piece. That was powerful. And, you know, as you go through, like, obviously, domestic violence is a huge issue for me. I talked about it. Suddenly, thousands of people are talking to me about it. And I don't know anything about it other than it happened to me. So I educated myself with women's aid. And um, I went to the Department of Justice and read up everything about the Istanbul Convention. And at the moment, I act as an ambassador in that space. I do lots of work with survivors. In fact, the documentary we just did a few months ago, sadly, there was only me and one other survivor who could talk. All of the rest of the contributors were people whose um, sisters, wives, uh, mothers had all been murdered by their partners. So we were talking to them about how difficult it was you know, you always feel that sense of guilt that you didn't know it was happening. So cancer obviously is a huge issue for me because of what I'm to Richard, particularly cancer research. Um, I think sometimes, you know, when you've pharma driven research, you're not necessarily seeking, you know, cures, you're seeking symptom control. So I, I really work very closely with the independent cancer research charities who fund things independently rather than through pharma. Um, I was very struck here in 2017 
the government asked me to be an ambassador for the Magdalene survivors. These are women, um, not just in Ireland, but across the world who might have had a child out of wedlock as a teenager or were just naughty. Um, or their parents had too many children and gave one away. There was a, quite a casual approach to children at that time. And they ended up working in really difficult circumstances in laundries. Their names were taken away. Sometimes they were given a number. Sometimes they were given a saint's name. Many of them suffered physical and psychological abuse. And uh, they, they won the right to get some compensation in 2013, but also the right to meet together and decide how they would be memorialized. So that was my job. I brought them into Ireland, a lot from the UK, Australia, America. One woman from Australia met her son for the first time. It was, it was quite, it had such a huge impact on me because I, you know, didn't have to twist many arms. The president said he'd host them. You know, they were treated like royalty here and everybody came out in the streets to greet them. They were bowled over by it all. And, and still I was getting letters from them saying it's the most positive experience of my life. For the first time I told my family about my years and them, they didn't even know I was in a Magdalene laundry. And, um, and I did a one one documentary the following year to, to follow the five powerful women's stories there. And then I got funding before COVID to do two one hour documentaries of them, um, which went out last March. That I feel is, you know, I think I'm the same as everybody. Something hit, you know, something hits me in life and it transforms you. And then you think you have to do more. You can't just allow that to be one thing and not try and finish it or do something better. The other thing in business terms is, you know, I came out of Dragon's Den and to be honest, I was doing breakfast, current affairs and politics, which was a 4 a.m. start for a couple of years. If I said to you now, get up at 4 a.m. next week, you'd say, oh, that would be tough. I did it every single day of the week for all of that period. It suited me and Dara. Richard had passed away and Dara was uh, young, 12, you know, going on 13. And we both went to bed at half nine and you know, did our homework for the next day. Um, but it wasn't for me long term. And I, I was doing other business formats. One is called The Takeover, which Sony bought, where you go into a business and kick out the boss and take over with the with the kids, uh, the staff and the company. It was, it was brilliant and I really enjoyed doing it. But I was also struck, I think, by the idea that in very socially disadvantaged areas, um, they're sometimes the best business people. You know, I, I belong to a lot of migrant women groups and gosh, they are driven. You know, the kids in this, I was brought up in a socially disadvantaged school. The odds of somebody like me doing what I've done are pretty slim. They still have a picture of me at the wall. And I say, I'm no spring chicken, so it's about time you guys had more. It's a very diverse school with lots of different cultures and nationalities. Um, and they do kind of Dragon's Den pitches. These are kids at 13, you know, who are selling their homemade soaps to me. And I could go into a very private school and very privileged children, and they sometimes can't even be bothered to turn up. So... So I worked for nine months with young women in the traveler community. Here in the UK, you call them gypsies. Um, they exist in America, but they're the largest and most socially disadvantaged indigenous community in Ireland, you know? And so of the four women, one of them had only had 10 weeks schooling. She, she was a young unmarried mother and um, she wanted to read stories with her child. She'd never learned to read or write, but she also designed, you know, blinged up design. Um, those four women just took my heart away. I lived in their community for nine months. I learned so much more about traveler culture, their language, their traditions. Um, but I'm very proud to say that all four of them did phenomenally well. I'm still great friends with them all. In fact, uh, Anne-Marie that I was just talking about who only learned, um, who only had 10 weeks of schooling is, is on her second baby, happily reading to them. She she kicked me out. We set up a business for her in design and the proudest moment was looking at this huge shop window with her first collection and her dad and mum there, we bawled our eyes out and drank some cheap fizz. And uh, about six months later, she said, I don't need you anymore. I loved it. I don't need you anymore. I'm going to do children's clothing designs. I just loved the fact that she was so empowered to do that. And instead of her, you know, she always, said, I don't want to be uh, taking social service, uh, you know, compensation. So, in fact, she now employs a lot of young women in the traveler community. So the power of one, Stephanie, that's what I say. You know, if you if you move into a space and you seriously want to address it, you will find a way, you know.
Yeah, that's so powerful. I'm so happy to hear those words. What do you think is your superpower, Nora? You are unbelievably passionate and powerful and everything you put your mind to, you really make such a huge difference. Where does that where does that sit? Where does that come from? Where do you draw that power from? Firstly, you know, I would say without overstating my own difficulties that my life wasn't too diff wasn't too easy you know it was pretty tough um but sometimes that gives you great resilience and strength and courage and i don't think anything in business for instance was ever as difficult as you know nursing saving somebody's life you know I, every time i sweated about a decision i'd say oh for goodness sake it really isn't life and death and you were in that situation um i also think that I, I'm not living the chapter I wanted to live, you know. I think Richard and I, you know, he worked at the BBC for 20 years, finally came into the business with me. Of course, we had dreams on New Year's Eve with a bottle of wine and all the things we wanted to do. And and we were licensing magazines from Australia. We spent six months in Australia, New Zealand um, and Asia. But life had other plans for me, you know. So when that boulder came down, the most difficult thing for me was... Um, the loss of Richard, but the loss of my life too, because I was on that road going somewhere with Richard and suddenly there was no road, there was no Richard. So reinventing myself was a huge part of my journey through grief. Um, and, and these are always difficult things to say. This is not what I would have wanted, but the reality is that in my middle years, I've just lived the most powerful decade of my life in professional terms, in fulfilling professional ambitions. I might actually be sitting in an armchair now, sipping Merlot, watching Netflix if Richard was still alive and enjoying all the good stuff in life, but that's not what life had for me. So uh, it's been a great chapter, not the chapter I wanted, but it's been great. And I love the fact that I'm very, I'm hugely involved in philanthropy. Um, I, I work with a network across the world of family offices in philanthropy. Um, that's really empowering. So, for instance, during COVID and the lockdown and the recession, most of our town centres have been quite diminished. So I was working here with various agencies trying to bring life back into town centres, you know, where there were boarded up shops and outside of the town was the big hypermarket. So the, the nucleus of the community was missing. And, and I came across a great guy through that network who is in Chicago and trying to do the same thing. And he'd already set up five plans. So I'd learned so much through him. I work with homelessness here. I feel like Groundhog Day, even though there's enough money in the homeless Let's say we've over 10,000 people homeless. By that, I don't mean rough sleepers, which is an entirely different thing. I mean, families and children um, homeless. Um, and... And I've learned so much from other global, particularly in Scandinavia, where they've been very brave and courageous in tackling it. So I'm just back from Davos. Um, that was the, as always, the most incredible brain boot camp for January. My head is on fire with all of the brilliant things, especially in climate and green tech and areas that are really, really important. Um, so I think, I think what's great about where I'm sitting right now is I still have my own companies. I'm still undecided about which documentaries. There's so many of them bubbling at the moment, but I haven't truly determined which one I will go into. And I always feel very comfortable just pausing. So after Christmas, I don't do New Year's resolutions, but I promised I would pause and soak up some of these great big thinkers and see how inspired I felt uh, to make a new decision as to where I might go. I think I found it, but too early to say. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like a real superpower, Nora, that you can pause and you give yourself yeah. that time to get inspired and, and then decide. Uh, that sounds like a real yeah. superpower to me. Nora, I'm wondering from all your life lessons, and you've had so many and so many powerful ones, what would your top tips be for other women? Be authentic. Um, I, I think I, I grew up in the boardroom when we all had to look like Margaret Thatcher. So more male than female. <clears throat> I was almost always the only woman in the room. And, um, and I think 
I adopted, uh, I, somebody once said to me, the biggest decision a woman in business has to make is will she go navy or black? So, of course, I was in there with my black or shades of black and gray suits all day, every day. And I was not authentic. And when I ran my own businesses, I tried to bring that authenticity. So, in other words, I hated that idea that you leave yourself at the door. You know, I always said to people, don't think of work-life balance because you're then imagining that your life is something that happens after five o'clock or before nine o'clock in the morning. Um, and that work is confined to that area. I'm lucky that I've always felt that that those two things are seamlessly intertwined for me, you know? Um, in fact, some of my best friends were my clients. I think they're my closest friends um, because, you know, all things being equal, people um, will buy from a friend. But by the way, all things not being equal, even if their quality is slightly less and their price is slightly higher, you still buy from a friend. <laughs> so, so my advice is authenticity is everything to me. Um, Telling my story was so important. We can't let young women believe we're beamed down from outer space as perfectly formed CEOs. They need to know that all of us had difficulties in our journey. And I know that when I talk, you know, given that one in four women go through domestic abuse, the, the odds are pretty high that people in the room also have gone through grief of, of various different types, not always death, you know, could be loss of a job, loss of an ability, loss of a relationship. So. It resonates with them. And, and any given week, I could be talking to the women in, uh, in the women's prison here, which I do a lot of work with, a lot of domestic violence issues and domestic abuse there. Um, or I could be talking to top chairmen and CEOs. Always be authentic. Tell your story. Own it. Um, and you know what? You will help so many more people. It, my generation never talked about homosexuality, about child abuse, about alcoholism. Uh, about drugs, about depression. Where did that get us? Where did that get humanity? Nowhere. Your lifelong legacy to the next generation has to be giving your testimony, has to be telling the truth and telling them, you know, in the best way you possibly can, how you got through it. Because sure as hell, they're going to go through it. And, and that's something that could derail, it does derail many people from fulfilling their ambitions. The other thing I say is, um, I always feel I have a moral imperative. When Richard died, I had that strong sense that there are lots of Richards out there. Lots of people with terminal illnesses, ability issues, social disadvantage, who will never get to fulfill their life and their potential. Um, so you kind of owe it to them. You know, if you're fit and healthy and standing on your own two feet, you ought to get out there and do some heavy lifting about making humanity better because you can't leave it to the young generation. That's very unfair. We have the, one of the longest life expectancies in the world. And it's up to you from about the age of 40 onwards, are you going to just let that drift along or are you going to set a sat nav for your brain? Because even when you hit 40, 50, 60, you still loads of life left. So don't keep looking backwards. Don't imagine your life is over. If you want to do a PhD, climb Kilimanjaro, my ambition. Um, if you want to go and write a book and play in a rock band, do it. You have loads of time to do it. And your brain loves all that. It loves for you to be thinking forward, to be sat in a little sat nav, which could be a small goal, you know, or set some big goals. But, you know, so many people drift into their middle years. And, and I know how it happens. You know, you get kids, your life is incredibly busy. You get up in the morning, get the kids to school, then go to work and then come home and put on the dinner, sit and watch Netflix after the kids are in bed up the next day. And, and you end up being quite, wrote in everything you do. I come across people all the time who, oh, I always go on holiday to this place. Sure, why would I go anywhere else? I know exactly where it is and I know what I'm doing as soon as I get there. Friday nights now, me and himself, we always go to the Indian. We never change from that. And my mother has a great phrase. So she'll say, don't sit next to him. He'd have a row at himself. But the great thing about keeping your brain healthy is having rows. Like my, when my son comes in the door now from university, he'll be talking about American politics, Ukraine. He's on fire. His brains are, you know. And as we get older, we have smaller circles of friends. We tend to cling to people that we that are like us. We like the fact that if we say, I don't like Donald Trump, everybody in your circle says, yeah, neither do I. So, you know, I think I would encourage people to get out of their comfort zone you know, set sat nows for themselves. Don't drift subconsciously into your middle years without saying, what have I still got to do? I always say to people, are you done? Is that it? You know, all of your education and all the great, you know, work your parents did, all the ambitions you had in your young, is that it? Are you done? 
are you quite happy now just drifting into frail elderly zone and so most people say no I'm not done yet I said you have to do something about it you know (laughs) amazing I I, I'm bowled over this is just the best interview ever Nora thank you for sharing all these incredible life lessons and how you turned them into even more and um, my last question would be, what are your plans or dreams for your future, Nora? Where's your journey going to go with all the things that you do? Um, I, I don't know if I can answer that question, honestly. I'm in the middle of two books. And weirdly, over COVID, instead of me finishing those two books that are way past deadline, the last one was with Penguin, I started writing a third book, which had nothing to do with the two books I have under contract. Um, So sometimes life and the world, you know, brings you in different directions. I know that this year I plan to do some of the things I've always wanted to do. You know, going to Davos was a big part of that. I'm off to the Grammys next week. Um, I'm in Dubai the week after speaking to some business people. I I think when I said I was pausing, I I sort of, I had a really rough 12 months. I had a a post-COVID crash. Uh, It's called a cytokine storm, very mild COVID. But unfortunately, my body was producing these antibodies for four weeks. And then I was in hospital for a month and I had inflammation in my brain and my heart and my lungs. And the professor who finally took me on, because nobody really knew what the hell was happening to me. As I say, very mild COVID. I worked through it. Um, He understood. He'd sent me all the studies from Stanford and uh, the endocrinology studies. So I was left with type 1 diabetes. Um which I now have an implant for, and I take insulin about 10 times a day because I'm a very um, unstable type 1 diabetic. And my brain is fine, thank God now, and my lungs are fine. My heart is still inflamed. So the more the more I was locked in with multiple, they took all my lymph nodes out, and I was kind of thinking, right, you're not to be a sick person. I've, I've never been a sick person. In fact, I hadn't seen a doctor for two years before this. So As soon as I got out from under it, I went to Ibiza and did yoga. Amazing. Came back, had three more weeks, went back to Ibiza and did yoga. (laughs) Um, We launched a great book in New York with The Vine. Um, I was in an incredible book with the Dalai Lama doing the forward, Jane Goodall, the Masoni family, the Reebok family. Still don't know, have to pinch myself with um, imposter syndrome sometimes as to why I'm in that book. But it was great to go to New York and they lit up all the screens in Times Square because it became a bestseller in about three days. So I, I feel that it's partly my mental health journey. I've never been an anxious person, but I'm anxious now. And I don't know why that is. My professor says, if you accept that COVID had a catastrophic effect on you physically, um, it probably did have some effect on you mental health wise. I, I breezed into the first television show I was doing. And five minutes before we went live, my hands started to shake. I had that rash, you know, going down my neck and my mouth was dry. And I was really, my head was just not good and my fellow presenter said what's going on and in fact we ended up doing a one-hour television show on my symptoms and I said don't ask me I don't even know the right phrases but talk to the professor so I felt I had two years in COVID which was very productive for me by the way because I worked remotely in radio and tv the whole time and if ever there was a need for lots of people to be able to do that it was those two years but the year that I was supposed to re-emerge <laughs> into the world was really difficult. And um, and I feel now, I'm only now, you know, I, I used to faint about four times a day, you know, because my insulin, I, I have no cells really left in my pancreas, but every now and again, as they're dying, they spurt a bit of insulin and I might've taken insulin, then I just keel over. So um, I had that strong sense of, it's not going to stop me doing all the things I want to do, but I'm damn sure I'm going to do things that are really important to me. Um, whereas before I kind of, I probably did too much over the last few years in terms of documentary making. And I feel there's a powerful documentary there that I have inside me, but I have to let it ferment a little bit. So I'm going to do some bucket list stuff, even though I hate the word bucket list, but some of the things I, I, I always wanted to do for a few months and see where it takes me. Nora, this has been just incredible. I can't thank you enough for your time and for talking to me today and sharing all your incredible story and life lessons. Thank you.